Hey everyone, thank you so much for checking out the AI Weekly Update series on Henry AI Labs. I know it's been a bit of a hiatus since I last made this video, so I want to just make a quick introduction to the series and kind of how I'm planning on changing it to maybe make it more sustainable and <laughs> go the distance with making these kind of videos. So I've got this big stack of papers from what came out this week, and um, I kind of wanted to just highlight kind of the challenge of, say, going through the like methodology, the, <laughs> the every takeaway they had in each of these papers. So kind of the objective is more so to complement, say, uh, AK92501 on, on Twitter about just kind of presenting the ideas in these papers as far as I understand them, maybe help connect it to some context and hopefully that is a useful supplement for finding something that you want to read each week. So with that said, thank you so much for watching the AI Weekly Update series and I really hope you find it useful. The papers for the Henry AI Labs AI Weekly Update series are sourced from AK92501 on Twitter. I highly recommend following for uh, these paper tweets. I love this. It's such a nice part of my week getting to check on these new papers from Archive. So thank you so much for curating these papers and for curating the content for the Henry AI Labs AI Weekly Update. Henry AI Labs is sponsored by Semi Technologies and the Weaviate Vector Search Engine. Please subscribe for all sorts of content about this open source vector search engine, including a new podcast series I'm doing, interviewing different people about uh, what kind of tools they're building by using the Weaviate vector search engine, as well as uh, different open source tools like Haystack and then Weaviate and other things like the Kenius academic paper mining system, and then all sorts of other content from Weaviate describing how to use it and different aspects of vector search and data science. So I highly recommend checking this out and thank you so much for watching. We'll start off with Facebook AI Research's new CM3, a causal masked multimodal model of the internet. I think this is one of the models that you can't miss in the latest development of things like Dolly, Clip, GPT-3, just the sequence of these massive models that have a big impact. So the particular reason that I think CM3 is so interesting is the way that they combine these different data sources. So they describe how they're combining text, hypertext like HTML markup, and the image tokens from a vector quantized variational autoencoder GAN. So to start off with these things, the HTML is extremely interesting because it allows for having uh, some kind of structured data. It's like a structured kind of unstructured hybrid where it allows you to say prompt it by having, uh, say you use the unstructured list, list UL tag and then you have the LIs and then you uh, have the mask there. So it generates an ordered list that way or you could you know, similarly generate a table that way. You can title uh, web pages by having the HTML title tag. So you get that kind of free lunch with the prompting or, or maybe not free lunch is the best way to describe it. A better way might be free annotation. You get that kind of uh, labeled data from the self-supervised learning and you can collect this kind of HTML annotation at scale. So the other really interesting thing are these image tokens that come from the vector quantized variational autoencoder GAN. So the vector quantized variational autoencoder, forgetting the GAN part, has this discrete code book. So when you do that compression bottleneck in the variational autoencoder and you compress the, say, an original image down to that low dimensional representation, you're now going to map that into discrete tokens and you use the straight through estimator to optimize the thing. But you have these discrete tokens that you can use to model in sequence and predict the discrete tokens. And I think that's a really interesting step for reducing the complexity of having this multimodal uh, task where say you're uh, predicting these continuous images in the middle of discrete text tokens, and then you kind of have all the problems that might come up with something like that. So then one other kind of detail that I liked about this paper is uh, they discuss their strategy for integrating uh, bi-directional masking with this left to right causal masking thing. So what they're doing is in the middle of a sequence, they will, so let me zoom in for this, uh, they'll add this mask zero where they have the size hints. So, um, so things like BART ha have these size hints where they're telling the language model how many intermediate tokens it's going to have to generate as a size hint for, uh, for when you're placing the mask, say it's just um, uh, mask, just mask anywhere, then you might probably do something like uh, there and uh, this, th those kind of words that kind of combine sentences compared to if you say uh, mask eight, and then it, it maybe is more informed that it's about to start a new sentence or things like that, I think will have a big impact. The kind of idea of long text generation in the masking objective, and then combining this idea of left to right. So what they do to combine left to right is they place the signals in the bidirectional context, but then the generation happens at the rightmost part of the sequence. So overall, uh, you can see at the end where they, um, they produce some images to show kind of the comparison of CM3 and say Dolly and this idea of uh, generating novel images. What they're doing is they're generating the discrete uh, VQVAE tokens and then those are mapped back into the encoder to produce the full image. So 
Overall, I think this kind of approach will be, you know, extremely powerful. I think the idea of using the HTML tags, that kind of free annotation for the self-supervised modeling, all in all, this seems like kind of the latest uh, state of the art in multimodal modeling. So one of the dimensions that I think the CM3 causal mass multimodal model is hitting on that's gonna be really important is the use of structured data. In this case, structured HTML tags and the hypertext in order to guide say prompting with title tags or list tags or table tags and all sorts of other ideas just like how to parse this data and how to use the document structure to further guide these tasks and there's so much information signal in it. And I think it's such a useful way of thinking about this kind of research direction. So this next paper, Unified SKG Unifying and Multitasking Structured Knowledge Grounding with Text-to-Text -text Language Models is, I think, an extremely impactful paper. So uh, let's go into figure two where they show uh, how they unify the different uh, structured data modalities and bring it back to text. So I, I've read another paper called Turning Tables, which similarly shows how to parse tables to turn it into uh, text prompt. So in this case, it looks like what they're doing is maybe still a pretty formal, pretty structured kind of representation for the text modeling. But there are some other approaches that would say take a table and then parse it to turn it into a natural language kind of sentence like the player Antonio wears number 21 compared to say this kind of style of how you uh, parse the table into natural language text. So this is what we mean by structured data. And I've, I've found this topic to be so interesting, learning a lot from uh, Bob Van Light at Weviate about how he thinks about these kinds of things and thinking about how structured data, say the JSON, the GraphQL APIs, the, the difference between relational database systems, and then all sorts of hidden structured data and how we combine structured and unstructured data is I think one of the most interesting topics with, with a lot of these real world applications with uh, particularly text mining. But so you see the knowledge graph, how that gets parsed into text, triples, ontologies, uh, formal language, all these different ideas of how you move this into uh, text. And then you have this unified framework for uh, modeling all these different kinds of inputs. And I think uh, here they show the different kinds of data sets that they're using to benchmark these systems of structured and unstructured data. Mostly uh, text is the unstructured data, but uh, really interesting research area. I think there's another uh, Wikipedia based data set that does this kind of thing. And I think this use of the structured information and uh, guiding, as we've seen, prompts are so effective. Having the structured data to guide the prompts should be a really interesting step. Next up is Data to VEC, a general framework for self supervised learning in speech, vision, and language. I'm really excited about this for the Weaviate vector search engine because of the ability to uh, encode any kind of data using this vectorization framework, although I think you wouldn't need to still train it in the given data domain for it to deploy it for some given new. Uh, data domain, whether it's speech, vision, language, uh, tabular data, graph structure data, biological data, all these different data sources that we can imagine and creating these different kinds of embedding spaces to search through them. So the idea here is that in vision and language, particularly because I don't know too much about speech, so I'm not going to talk about it. But in vision, particularly, there's a lot of data augmentation, a lot of particular domain biases for the vision domain, like rotation, translation, say increasing the brightness that make contrastive representation learning for vision work really well. And in language, similarly, uh, they rely on, say, uh, annotating pairs of data. So for example, in the core question pairs data set, you have 400,000 examples of duplicate questions. There are many other data sets like this, the um, machine reading paraphrase corpus. Uh, I highly recommend checking out uh, sentence transformers, sbird.net, to see more examples of these kinds of data sets. But the idea of data to VEC is to create a framework such that you don't use these particular biases for any kind of data domain. And that'll make sense in a second as we look at this. So the, I, the idea of data to VEC, similar to bootstrap your own latent, is that the student is going to be trying to predict what the teacher had, how the teacher had represented the input data. But differently from bootstrap your own latent, the student is going to receive a masked version of the input, whereas the teacher is going to receive the original input. So the student is basically trying to predict what the full representation will look like given this masked context of the original and then predicting what the original representation would look like. So I think in a similar framework as some of these intermediate layer knowledge distillation techniques, like say distill BERT, it's going to predict say layer four representation, layer eight representation, and then say that final penultimate layer vector representation, say layer 12 or whatever it is. But so you see how this generalizes across images, speech and language, how you can just generalize this framework of masking out a part of the input and predicting and then mapping these two representations through this kind of teacher student framework. So it's a very general framework, which is very interesting. We've seen some other techniques like this that unify it again, bootstrap your own latent would kind of work in any data domain like this, because 
uh, it's not too heavy on data augmentation, but then there's also um, the domain agnostic contrastive learning paper. And what makes that domain agnostic is the data augmentations that you use are something that would generalize, so say uh, dropout or mix up, these kinds of things that you can use for any kind of data compared to rotation where you can't figure out how to translate rotation into language. Also on the topic of improving sentence embeddings, we have prompt BERT, improving BERT sentence embeddings with prompts. And I was so excited when I saw this paper title. I can't believe there hasn't been a lot of research on this already because we've seen a wave of papers on how prompting can do few shot learning, zero shot learning with these large language models. But I don't think there's been a lot of research on this particular idea of prompting it to produce better sentence embeddings, which you would put into a document index of something like Weaviate and use algorithms like HNSW or uh, the product quantization, all these different ideas to construct these vector indexes to search through these sentence embeddings. And the search can enable these really interesting applications in retrieval, I've seen a recent wave, say WebGPT, Retro, all these cool ideas of how retrieval can really help. So here's a really interesting new technique to improve the quality of these sentence embeddings and improve how well these, um, these embeddings really do return semantic nearest neighbors. So the idea of prompting is to add these templates to the input. And we've seen all sorts of things where whether these templates are a few examples of the task, or in this case, it's something like, say, when you used uh, prompting in early papers like pattern exploiting training, this kind of framework would show you how to map, say, uh, mass language modeling into natural language inference. You'd add some kind of prompt that looks very similar to what we're seeing here with prompt BERT. So the idea is if you start off with the original uh, token where you have just the input and then mask, then you get this kind of score with this uh, semantic text similarity uh, evaluation data set compared to if you if you instead get the representation by having this sentence and then in quotes the sentence means and then mask that template prompts it to get a much better sentence representation so a sentence representation in this case i'm pretty sure what they're doing is they're uh, indexing the mass token to get the representation for the whole sequence compared to they, they have a whole really great the first half of their paper is devoted to taking apart uh, the different strategies for how you actually get these embeddings so this section three rethinking the sentence embeddings of original BERT. They discuss a lot of interesting ideas, like whether you should just index that CLS token, whether you should average out the word embeddings from, from the original input matrix, whether you should do say like that sequence pooling thing, like where uh, Siamese BERT will do that average pooling along the sequence axis to get the sentence embedding. There are all sorts of interesting ideas that they take apart in the paper. But the high level idea of prompt BERT is that adding these prompts improves the sentence embedding when you're still indexing along the uh, output representation to produce the final vector that you're going to put into say uh, in this case they're they're using it for I think they probably do cosine similarity between the representations to evaluate it but generally you would take these embeddings put them in something like the Weaviate HNSW and it will traverse it to find nearest neighbors for new queries. Next up we have zero prompt scaling prompt based pre-training to 1000 tasks improves zero shot generalization so this could be a really exciting trend for those of us who don't spend uh, 60 days using 1024 TPUs <laughs> to train these models. So this idea is the idea of scaling up the number of task annotations in this kind of prompting framework to achieve better performance other than just scaling up the model sizes. And they actually make an interesting kind of claim where they say the model size has little impact on the performance with an extremely large number of tasks. And we'll see also with Google's new Lambda model with 137 billion parameters, they also cite that, um, that just scaling the model size up alone doesn't help with safety and it doesn't help with groundedness. And I think that idea of factual grounding is an extremely important part of these language models and making them useful for anything other than just having a casual conversation or something like that. So this idea of zero prompt is basically the idea where in the past one we looked at prompt BERT where you're using prompts to guide the sentence embedding task. You use prompts to do all sorts of things like um, to format question answering, to format natural language inference, to format uh, whatever it will be. And there, there are data sets like unified QA that take all the question answering data sets and they use templates to map them into yes, no answers. This kind of uh, thinking of how we can unify all these different annotated tasks. You see this table has uh, 17 sentiment analysis tasks, nine news classification tasks, and 10 classification for say uh, queries and what people, whether it's an information seeking query is, I love that word for thinking about these kinds of things and all these different kinds of tasks that they're using to in their uh, claim scale up the task size to get better performance than model scaling. I still expect model scaling to be very important, but it's very interesting to see this kind of claim and this kind of trend around trying to create 
more efficient counterparts. So quickly, here's another paper on the use of knowledge distillation and these contrastive representation learning frameworks and this overall idea of going from embeddings to some other kind of application. In this case, it's different from data to VEC because we're trying to take the original embedding and then use that as a bootstrapping point for some kind of downstream supervised learning task. In this case, fo focusing on the CLIP image to text alignment model. So CLIP has this objective of contrastive learning between vision and text. So you see how it has these two uh, representation heads. It has the vision head and it has the text head and it's trained with contrastive learning to try to align uh, image text captions from an internet scrape. So this is describing a technique to use knowledge distillation to signal the salient tokens from the clip vision head into some downstream pairwise vision text encoder. So uh, this is this topic of thinking fast and slow and how that might apply to search and when you might want to slow down computation to say use a pairwise ranker compared to these Siamese architectures that are typically used for retrievals and for a Siamese architecture that produces a vector embedding and then you say cosine distance HNSW vector indexes to do the kind of embedding search but then you might want to take that uh, kind of coarse grained retrieval and then put it into a more fine grained re-ranking step with pairwise encoding. So this technique is using a distillation task taking the representations from clip to fine tune it into a uh, pairwise a pairwise model that processes the text and the vision with knowledge distillation. So to give one more testimonial to the effectiveness of prompts before heading over to Google's new Lambda model, this new paper, Memory Assisted Prompt Editing to Improve GPT-3 After Deployment, is in my opinion a really great breakthrough for the user interface and how we really deploy and use these GPT-3 models. So similar to the effectiveness of prompting, we can kind of we can just iteratively adapt to these prompts with user feedback. So so the example the authors give is a uh, user what word is similar to good GPT-3 the homonym of good is would user similar to means with a similar meaning and the GPT-3 notes this writes it to memory. So by writing it to memory it's going to append this to the context. So you see this uh, omega x retrieved context or prompt from the memory. So it's going to retrieve this prompt, add it to the input, and now by using this adaptive interface, GPT-3 now has this uh, similar to means with a similar meaning before it sees what word is similar to good, and then it's able to do that kind of prompted few shot learning, which is a remarkable ability of these models to do a better, uh, to more better align with what the user is trying to use GPT-3 for. So this idea of uh, to, of guided text generation. I think there's another word they use for it where it's say controlling text generation or maybe conditional text generation has been a huge topic forever with things like uh, fine tuning the models is something that OpenAI seems to be publishing that seems to work well. Uh, other things like say using a discriminative classifier where you classify different outputs as you traverse. Because another interesting thing about these language models is that you commonly have a tree structure generation where you say could do beam search, top case search, and things like OpenAI's codex has this repeated sampling through the decoding tree. And code is so interesting because you can repeatedly sample through that decoding tree and then you put it into a compiler and you can only take the path that actually compiled with that kind of filtering strategy. But in text, they, they, the analog for that is to say have a discriminative model that serves in the, as the compiler and the same kind of idea. But that's kind of a, off the topic of this paper. But so this idea for having this user interface of this memory enhanced GPT-3, you could imagine similarly with these alleviate vector search applications for retrieving information. You could also retrieve prompts and have a big memory index and embeddings for the prompts as well, I think, for this kind of retrieval based strategy of uh, fine tuning and directing the output of GPT-3. It's another really interesting paper on how to really use these models. Next up is a can't miss update this week. Google's new Lambda language models for dialogue applications. The scale of this alone is uh, is amazing. They have 137 billion parameters. So similar to GPT-3 at 175 billion parameters, this has 137 billion parameters. And it's been pre-trained on one point, let's say six trillion words of public dialogue data and web text. And then you see uh, down here they describe the uh, compute required 1024 TPU v3 chips for a total of about 57.7 days. So this is really like pushing the cutting edge of massive chatbots. So the, I think the past the MENA chatbot, I think that was somewhere in the ballpark of 10 billion parameters. So this is, you know, a 10x scale of that, which is pretty incredible. So 
One of my favorite things about this paper, similar to uh, the Mina chatbot paper, is the effort they've put into uh, creating all these different metrics for chatbots. So you see they have things like sensibleness, specificity, interestingness, safety, groundedness, informativeness, uh, citation accuracy, helpfulness, and role consistency. So these are some really interesting ways of evaluating a conversation. So these uh, chatbots, they're targeting generic conversations, which I think is kind of a pretty grandiose search space of having one model that could talk to you about anything, but they have these different kinds of metrics that they use. And you see in the blog post how they, uh, sorry that this is cut off, but how they compare their uh, chatbot with humans and uh, human rated uh, assessment of these different kinds of metrics. So this is the key one. These two are the key ones, in my opinion, that are lacking. And this interesting trend where they even say that they don't think that continued model scaling is going to cause this phase shift in increased factual groundedness. And if the models aren't generating factually correct information, then I don't really understand what the use of them would be other than, say, representation learning for then downstream fine tuning and the transfer learning kind of setup. But they also have some interesting discussions around uh, fine tuning it. They show how they do the context, the sentinel, the response, this what's up, response, not much. And then they also describe how they can do discriminative fine tuning in the language modeling framework. So similar to how uh, the text to text transfer transformer T5 model unifies all the supervised learning tasks in the language modeling framework by using, uh, in that case, I think it's just the prepended question answering, natural language inference, text classification. But in this case, similar to using prompts and templates, they add sensible and then the rating. So they fine tune the generation, the discriminative model, which is going to be filtering different candidate generations with this kind of prompting strategy. And then they uh, describe how they're fine tuning to learn to call an external information retrieval system. And obviously with working with Weaviate vector search engine, I've been extremely excited about these kinds of retrieval systems. So I love to see any kind of mention of using these. So this is what they're going to be using to improve the factual groundedness. It has a calculator, a translator, and then an and information retrieval system. So they describe partitioning the end uh, deployment into two phases where you have Lambda base and then you have Lambda research. So Lambda research is the model that's using the calculator translator and the information retrieval to supplement the answer to information seeking questions. And this kind of idea of information seeking questions, I think in addition to just kind of a chatbot that can, you know, as we think about personal assistance and all sorts of things that we can imagine these systems being really super game changing technology. But this kind of idea, I think of information seeking queries is I think the thing that's right at the frontier right now. Next up, we have co author designing a human AI collaborative writing data set for exploring language model capabilities. And I think this is such an exciting idea. And there are quite a few things I want to say about it. But to start off with, I first read Google's paper WordCraft and WordCraft describes deploying the Mina chatbot. Now we have the Lambda chatbot, which is 10 times bigger into a text editor and using the conversational AI chatbot dialogue system as a writing assistant and then seeing what kind of user interface controls, whether it's say bi-directional editing or if it's left to right editing, uh, say suggestions, summarization, what kind of tasks you would want your writing assistant to perform. And this data set co-author is uh, using 63 writers, four instances of GPT-3 across 1,445 writing sessions. So they're really collecting the data of how people are really using these uh, writing data sets. And I love this topic of uh, human AI or um, human computer interaction, HCI. This seems to be such an important research area, especially for these language models and integrating them into these different tools. So my experience with using these tools began with just uh, plugging in a language model to the Streamlit interface. I think you'd be amazed to see how easy it is to plug your language model into a Streamlit HTML interface if you want to explore, uh, say, writing some text and then using left to right generation to see what your language model wants to put at the end of the text. That kind of interface is really easy to set up. And then one other thing I think is really interesting is uh, in the second episode of the Weaviate podcast, I interviewed Charles Pierce at Kenius. And Kenius is building this really exciting uh, scientific literature mining system where they've integrated it into Google Docs. And you could also imagine, say, things like Keras BERT or whatever code parrot, code model you're training, you can integrate it into VS Code. VS Code has plugins similar to how Google Docs lets you add an app or Microsoft Word lets you add an app to the uh, software platform. Same with Slack. I could go on about these different uh, apps that let you just kind of plug in your functionality into it. But we, we are now really able to plug these language models into our writing workflows 
So I think it'll be really interesting to see how people use it. I love this effort of co-author and starting to understand how people want to use these kinds of writing models and what they're really used for, I think is such an interesting kind of way of looking at this. Next up, we have Gradtail, learning long tail data using gradient based sample weighting. One of my favorite scientists in this space has been Sarah Hooker, who has published some really exciting papers separating this idea of reducible and irreducible error with long tails, uncertain kind of uh, data in your data set. Uh, what, uh, Sarah Hooker and uh, the collaborators presented this idea of using data augmentation to alter the image and see if that uh, helps reduce the uncertainty. And then if it does, you can point to that being maybe something that is reducible compared to if you augment it and the model just still has no idea what's going on, that's irreducible. So that's one kind of way of thinking about it. And that was my favorite mental model for thinking about this kind of problem. And this paper is saying that, well, the problem with that kind of is that you're waiting for the model to converge to get the signal. You, you need it to be like a pretty strong model to have that kind of signal where as you augment it, it becomes more reducible. So they're instead using the gradients. They use dot products between gradients in order to get this sense of what kinds of uh, long tail parts of your data set are, are something that should be a high sample weight or what is like just kind of noise in your data set and shouldn't be prioritized in this way. So it's a really interesting way of uh, kind of making sure that the model isn't too biased to the majority instances of your data set and the majority kind of even the you know the subcategories within labels and this kind of idea so it's a very interesting solution to this problem of say class imbalance and maybe domain imbalance and self-supervised learning and a very interesting strategy for overall improving these models next up we have collapse by conditioning training class conditional gans with limited data so one of the most fun things to do in deep learning i think is to collect an image data set and then test out GANs on generating new images, whether it's Pokemon images, house images, cars, shoe designs, all sorts of ideas. I think this is one of the most fun things to do. But so the, the idea of this paper is we use this idea of conditional GANs where you use uh, some kind of embedding for the different class labels. So say it's CIFAR 10 and you have uh, ship, horse, frog, uh, car, these kinds of ideas. You add that information to the random noise to help guide the generator and also help guide the discriminator for uh, real fake and also say the info GAN strategy of also classifying the image by using the conditional information and generally that kind of conditioning seems to break up the complexity of the optimization task this paper is highlighting that that kind of uh, class conditioning actually kind of accelerates the mode collapse problem so mode collapse would be say you're generating frogs and it only generates one particular kind of frog and it's collapsed onto that one kind of frog rather than covering the whole space of you know, all the frogs you might imagine. So what they're doing is they have this uh, gradual curriculum of introducing the conditional, a smoother transition from unconditional to conditional. Uh, they show how this works better for the limited data setting, similar to say the uh, ADA framework with adaptive data augmentation is another kind of strategy for uh, utilizing data augmentation overall this space of GANs and controlling the, the different say style embeddings and the control filters of this this has just been such an amazing face uh, space to follow along with and there's been so many recent advances there's also not to get too distracted but there's one paper uh, from Google AI I think that is using the style factors of the generator to explain the decisions in the classifier and I think that's such an exciting research direction so I highly recommend checking out this paper as well if you're experimenting with this kind of stuff yourself. So finally we have hyper transformer model generation for supervised and semi-supervised few shot learning so I, I don't think I really understood this paper so I'm going to just uh, put over the figure while I do my kind of rambling of what I think is happening with this paper. So from the high level overview, I think what's happening is the transformer is generating the weights or the activations of a smaller convolutional neural network. So I think the way that this is a few shot learning problem is I think the convolutional neural networks have maybe been uh, trained with different initializations. And so they're predicting different final convergence points when the CNNs have been trained from the different initializations and that's how you form the support. Or I think what's happening is uh, you have the support of something like say Omniglot and you have the uh, the few shot activations and so uh, it's say one kind of transformer and the trans and one kind of CNN sorry one architecture and it has these different activations for the different support samples for say the different uh, assembled alphabets of Omniglot and the transformer is predicting the activations for uh, new few shot learning sets so you use the transformer to be kind of the meta reasoning model over the few shot learning and over the CNN's activations so maybe that's more correct with what they're doing but overall I'm not exactly sure what this is putting together but generally this framework and I really enjoyed uh, Yana Kilster did an interview about predicting the weights of novel neural networks and I think this is such an exciting direction for say neural architecture search and meta learning this idea that you can abstract the concept of predicting the weights into a bigger neural network that can then have a data set of 
uh, final weights and then you can have that kind of uh, optimization problem one step up and do the same kind of uh, learning frameworks just with the labeled data set being the final weights of different uh, student neural network models and that teacher student kind of way of thinking about outer inner loop meta learning so Overall, I think this is a really exciting direction for uh, for this kind of idea of neural architecture search and for facilitating this problem. I'm sorry I don't completely understand it, but hopefully someone out there will look into this and maybe can correct my understanding of it.